Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the displacement current, which is a certain term that appears in Maxwell's equations. So what we're going to do is try to get some physical intuition as to the meaning of the displacement current and why it's so important um, and understand in particular why Maxwell's equations could not be consistent um, without that displacement current term. So the way we're going to do this is by considering a particular physical system, which is the one that I've drawn on the screen, which is basically just a parallel plate capacitor being charged by some current I. Now, simply because there is a current flowing, there must be a magnetic field around the wires. And by symmetry, we know the magnetic field should be sort of wrapping around in circles around the wires. So if I just sketch on um, a particular field line, uh, it's going to look like this. It looks elliptical because we're looking at this in 3D, but that's really sort of a, a circular field line. And the direction of the magnetic field is going to be according to the right hand rule. So you put your thumb in the direction of the current and your fingers of your right hand sort of curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. So if you do that, you'll see that the B field, the magnetic field B should be sort of coming down um, at that point there, and then going back into the screen down at the bottom there. But how do we actually get the strength of that magnetic field? Well, if you know Ampere's law, you might be thinking that that's pretty easy. Um, but let's work through it in full. And in doing so, it will become clear why we have to be a little bit careful in this situation, and why things are maybe not as simple as you might think. So Ampere's law basically says that current is the source of magnetic field. Um, expressed more quantitatively, it says that the line integral of your magnetic field B around some closed curve um, is a constant mu naught times the surface integral of J, which is the current density. In other words, the flux of the current density. And that surface integral is over a surface which is bounded by the curve that we did our line integral around. Now, in this case, from the symmetry, the easiest thing to do would just be to do your line integral around a circle of constant B, uh, constant magnetic flux density. And so if we say that circular um, path that I drew on earlier has a radius of r, then the line integral is just the circumference 2 pi r times b, because b is constant along that line. Now the right hand side, which is the flux of current density, is just going to be mu naught times i. We don't even need to do the surface integral. In fact, doing the surface integral um, in terms of current density would be a bit overcomplicated here, because it doesn't really matter how the current is distributed within the wire and whether the wire is even finite or not, all of the current I is going to be uh, flowing through the surface that we're integrating over. So the flux of the current density must be I. And so of course you arrive at the result that the strength of your magnetic field is just uh, mu naught I divided by two pi R. So this all seems quite reasonable so far. Where's the problem? Well, the problem is that Ampere's law doesn't specify a particular surface to integrate over. All that matters is that the surface that you integrate your current density over is bounded by the curve that you did your line integral of B over. Now the simplest possible such surface is just the circular surface bounded by the circular line. Um, and that gives us the result that we just got, right? B is mu naught I over two pi R. But what if we were to make things a bit more complicated and choose a different surface to integrate over, right? It wouldn't be as easy, but it should still work according to Ampere's law. In particular, I want to consider the surface where we basically make a cylinder. So I'm just going to put that, uh, another copy of that circle there. Then we join those up with straight lines like so. And remember the surface we've made here is not a closed surface. The left end of the cylinder, the left end there is an open part of the surface, right? Whereas the right hand end, which I'm now shading in, that's a closed surface, right? I'm not going to shade in the whole thing because then the diagram is going to get very messy, but the, uh, the curved part of the cylinder, that's also part of the closed surface, right? So if you do apply Ampere's law to this new cylindrical surface that we've made, um, the left hand side, the line integral is still just two pi r b for the same reason, that's no different, but the right hand side is now zero because you don't have any flux of current density um, through the surface, right? There is no flux of current density going out of the curved part of the surface because the current is just flowing from, from left to right along the axis of that cylinder. And there's also no flux of current density going to the closed circular surface of the cylinder on the right hand side because we've specifically placed that um, end of the cylinder between the plates of the capacitor where there is no current flowing. So this is clearly inconsistent because 
originally we got b is mu naught i over t phi r now we're getting b is just zero and we should get the same result regardless of which surface we choose to integrate over so let's think about how we can fix that by making a small alteration to Ampere's law. So I'm going to delete that because obviously it's not true. And I'm going to copy Ampere's law. And one modification we could try making to this would be instead of just taking the flux of the current density J, we take the flux of J plus something unknown, which I'm currently just going to call x as a vector because we don't really know what it is. And we choose this mysterious x thing in such a way that it compensates for the lack of flux of current density um, if we happened to inconveniently place our surface between the plates of the capacitor where there's no current. So in other words, this x is some sort of as yet unknown electromagnetic influence um, which produces a flux to the surface and makes Ampere's law consistent. Now what sort of electromagnetic influence might we find between the plates of a parallel capacitor? Well, you're charging it, you're building up a positive charge on the left-hand plate because by definition current is the flow of positive charge. Uh, you're going to have a negative charge, equal and opposite negative charge, building up on the right-hand plate and therefore there will be an electric field between the plates pointing from positive to negative like so. So let's just label those arrows as um, vector E I'll also note that the charge on the positive plate, let's call that Q, and let's call the charge on the negative plate minus Q. Now I've shown in a previous video that the strength of the electric field in a parallel plate capacitor, E, is given approximately by the charge Q divided by the constant epsilon naught times A, which is the area of each plate. So I guess I should label that as well. Each plate has an area of A. So our physical intuition therefore suggests that this mysterious X term that we've added um, as a source of magnetic field lines in our modified Ampere's law should have something to do with the electric field. So let's see if we can make that idea a bit more quantitative. So what requirements does X have to satisfy? Well, if you apply our modified Ampere's law, you get 2 pi RB. If we consider the cylindrical surface, the more complicated surface, um, then the right-hand side, because J is zero, right, over the surface of um, our cylinder, the right-hand side is going to be mu naught times just the flux of x, right? So surface integral of x dot ds. And therefore, if we want to get consistent results, regardless of which surface we use, then by comparing this equation with this equation, the left-hand sides are already the same, so the right-hand sides also have to be the same. Um, and that means we have the requirement that the flux of x through our surface is just equal to uh, the current flowing through the wire. So our first thought then might be to propose that maybe uh, this x vector should be proportional to the electric field, but then that quickly becomes a problem because the expression for electric field is just q over epsilon on a, and that itself is not directly related to the current. Right? We need the flux of x to be equal to the current. What we could notice, however, is that um, the Q here, the charge on each plate, is actually closely related to the charging current, I, because by definition, current is the rate of flow of charge, so I is just dQ by dt, right? So x being proportional to E itself can't work, but if we were to differentiate our electric field with respect to time, um, let's just write that down, then that seems like it's going to be promising, right? So if we say x should be proportional to dE by dt, then can we get this to work? Can we figure out anything about k? Well, using this requirement that the flux of x should be the current, the flux of x, if it's k times dE by dt, um, is going to be k times, now dE by dt is just going to be i over epsilon naught a, right, because you just differentiate that q, the area is not varying with, uh, with time, so we get i over epsilon naught a there. Now to turn that into the flux of x through this uh, circular face of the cylinder, all we have to do, because this is, it's a uniform electric field, all we have to do is multiply that by the area of each plate, because the electric field is equal to, or the rate of change of the electric field is i over epsilon naught uh, a um, in the region directly between the two plates, but as soon as you go 
outside the region between the two plates, then the electric field is zero. So you only get a contribution to the flux over the area of the plates um, themselves. And then this is required to be uh, I, right? Going back to, uh, to that requirement. So um, most of the terms cancel, right? The A's cancel, the I's cancel from both sides. And we conclude that our constant of proportionality um, should just be epsilon naught. And therefore that this X vector that we're proposing is supposed to be epsilon naught times DE by DT. So our conclusion then is that the source of magnetic field lines is not just the flow of electric current, but also uh, time varying electric fields have to act as a source of field lines as well, right? Because in our modified Ampere's law, J and, and this X vector um, appear on equal footing there. So they both act as sources of, of magnetic field. And X, which is epsilon naught DE by DT, that is called the displacement current. Now, as a final note, let's uh, put all this together and write one of Maxwell's equations in differential form. If you look back at our, um, our updated version of Ampere's law and apply Stokes' theorem from vector calculus to that, um, then basically this stuff here, J plus X, uh, well, times mu naught, should be the curl of B, right? I'm not going to introduce Stokes' theorem um, in, in this video, so I'm going to assume you're already familiar with that. If you're not, then you may want to look it up. But the implication of Stokes' theorem is that uh, the thing that we integrate over the surface has to be the curl of uh, the thing that we did the line integral of, which is B. And so we conclude that uh, the curl of B is mu naught times the current density plus mu naught times x, which itself is epsilon naught times um, dE by dt. Now note, by the way, that this is not a proof, right? I would describe what we've done here as more of a plausibility argument for the presence of this displacement current term. But nonetheless, I hope this has given you a bit of intuition as to why that term is um, important and why it's necessary. And thanks for watching. See you again soon.